I would probably take an average 1-2 grinder playing his A game over an average 25-50 grinder playing his C game any day. You're listening to the Mindset Advantage podcast. Each week, you'll get to peek inside the greatest minds in the game and discover what makes them successful. Mental toughness separates those that can't handle the stress. If you're going to treat it like an amateur, you're probably going to have amateur results. Now here's your host, Elliot Rowe. Hey, Elliot Rowe here. I'm very excited to announce that for the next few episodes, Stephen Baker will be guest hosting the show. Stephen has experience both as a professional poker player, strategic coach, and now a member of my mindset performance coaching world. I can confidently say that Stephen is one of the world's leading experts in poker mindset and performance, and I'm really excited to hear the conversations he has with some fantastic guests. And with that, here's Stephen. My guest on today's podcast is Alec Torelli. Alec is a high stakes professional poker player turned digital entrepreneur. Alec also runs the poker training site, Conscious Poker. So in today's podcast, Alec will be sharing his insights across all of these disciplines. So stay tuned and let's listen to Alec's insights. Well, Alec, uh, welcome. I've been really looking forward to this podcast and thank you very much. Great to see you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it, Stephen, and uh, happy to be here. Been following a long time, so it's cool, uh, cool to finally do this. That's great. Well, look, I want everybody, lots of people will know you, but not everybody will know your story in terms of how you first got into poker and then how you progressed through to becoming a professional. Let, let's just start from the beginning. How did you get into poker? And then just maybe take us through from that point onto the point where you became a professional player. Great question. So I started in the moneymaker boom. I got invited to a friend's house to play poker and I won my first time and that really got me hooked on the game. I found something that I thought I could beat friends at, whereas, you know, in sports in high school, uh, I wasn't always competitive. I wasn't very good at sports, but poker felt like something that I had a knack for. I could, it clicked for me and that early, those early wins really made it very exciting, especially at a young impressionable age uh, in high school. So I continued playing throughout high school, got pretty serious, you know, I'd be one of the best players in my local home games, started playing online, read some books, uh, and just started dedicating a lot of my free time to poker. And when I went to college, I was a freshman at SMU in Dallas, Texas. And I, I kind of realized, like, I came to this crossroads where I was spending so much time playing poker, like in local home games and online and with friends and that I couldn't really dedicate myself to playing the level of poker that I wanted to and improving and competing as well as stay focused on school and have a social life. Like it's just something had to give. So I realized um, I have a big decision to make. I'm at a crossroads and I either have to like basically stop playing poker and commit to school and everything that entails or go all in on poker and give school a break for a year. And so I kind of had to, to, to weigh this risk reward and basically realized like, you know, my worst case scenario um, if I give up school is just that I lose the money I saved and I'm one year behind everyone else in this process of going to school and getting a job, et cetera. Um, and I'm broke just like everyone else. Like I lose the money I saved up. And so like it just kind of put this into perspective that it really wasn't that bad if I gave myself this chance to play poker and I realized like, if I don't do this now, it's only going to get harder later. Like it's going to get harder my second year. It's going to be harder my third year because I'm more, you know, pot committed to school. It's going to be harder when I have a job or when I have a family or whatever. And so I just kind of took that plunge. That was like a big pivotal moment for me. It's just like having that courage to go all in on, on what I really wanted to do. And that kind of set the stage of change my relationship with poker and myself and like how I started treating myself and the game and, um, my reverence for the game because I was then a professional. Like I decided, Hey, I'm going to do this full time. Um, and that kind of like, I gave myself the at bat, you know, that kind of like put me out there in the arena, um, to give it a shot. And so, you know, I started at 18, that was in 2005. Um, I had some early successes playing online, playing tournaments, uh, went to Aruba, made the final table there of a WPT. When I was 19, I moved to Australia, um, because I couldn't play in the U S and it was there. I won the biggest tournament in online history at the time. It was called the F-Tops. It was over a quarter million dollars and um, became a very big winner in cash games 
I was playing the nosebleed cash games on full tilt that year, um, made over a million dollars in 2007. Uh, I was like 18, 19 years old that year. So uh, that kind of really, you know, set my career going uh, at a very young age, which was, uh, it was, you know, surreal to see, you know, just being six months a year before playing whatever, two, five, five, ten online uh, to going up to 200, 400 uh, so quickly. It just kind of was a lot to take in all at once, but uh, that kind of launched my poker career. Wow. That's, that's, that, that's, that's really interesting. There's lots of things I want to pick up on there because one of the things you did, I mean, I, it's, it's interesting. We had very contrasting routes. When I became a professional poker player, I did it in my forties. So wow. I, I, I had the, the opposite, um, in terms of, I did have things to lose, but by that stage, I, I don't know, I'm going to ask you, you know, you at university, did you get any parental pressure, um, or, you know, pressure from fa family more broadly about, Hey, what are you doing? You know, you're, you're going into professional poker, you know, here you are at university. Shouldn't you be pursuing a conventional career? Did you have any of that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, my family was very supportive. Uh, so I, I got kind of lucky there just with, um, with them understanding and being very supportive and always like, you know, cheering for me, um, and, and then supporting me with whatever I do, you know, it might not have been like, their first choice at the time, right? They probably would have preferred I stay in school, but um, especially because poker was so esoteric at the time and it was like, you know, it was risky and it was unconventional and it was, um, you know, counterculture, I guess. So, um, but at the same time, they were very supportive. And I think that actually played like a big role in the sense that I had the support of like the very close nucleus of people around me. But I guess the broader circle of people around me um, it, it mostly thought I was crazy, you know? So, um, friends, uh, teachers, college counselor, um, girl I was seeing at the time, like just everyone around me kind of mm -hmm. thought it was crazy. So, um, that, that's pretty normal, but I think it, any, it, I think it's a good learning lesson because anytime you do something that's, that's non-consensus, you know, you're going to have a lot of people that don't agree with it. That's the, the very definition of being non-consensus, right? Um, yeah. whether it's investment or, a life decision or, you know, taking a new job or moving or whatever it is. And so I think it's important to, to have your own voice, your own thoughts, your own conviction, be a louder presence than the sum of everyone else's thoughts. You know, Absolutely. so if you let like the cumulative opinion of others speak louder to yourself than your own conviction, you know, you're going to be le leading someone else's life. Right. But your, you know, life is a, is a, not a single player game, but it's like a first person game, right? So you're the one in control. You're the one in the driver's seat. You're the one, you know, ultimately making the decisions. And so um, that was a test. And I, I, I kind of looked at it like that. Like, well, you know, how, how confident are you in your decision? Because everyone's putting you to the test and they're really, you know, testing whether or not you uh, you have conviction in what you want to do. Yeah. So that was, uh, yeah, no, it's, 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 I think it's different. It's interesting in poker too. It's kind of like the same thing at the table, like, it's one thing to know what you think the right decision is, but it's a different thing to be able to actually make the right decision. People are like, oh, I knew you were bluffing, but it's like, well, shit, you still folded. You didn't really know I was bluffing. If you knew I was bluffing, you would have called, right? Like, so Absolutely. it's kind of like that in life too, right? Where it's like, okay, you can know the right decision, but you, you have to actually execute and go all in. Absolutely. Or otherwise you don't win the hand. You're, you know? you're right. That very statement, I, I, I know you're bluffing. If I had a dollar for every time somebody said that and then folded, I think I'd be a rich man. But um, yeah, absolutely. Totally. Um, let's just talk about your professional career. Um, obviously, this is the thing. People see the end result quite often and they think, wow, it was just a, a you know, sort of onward march from the point you, you know, obviously you did have success early, um, but it doesn't always follow that people who have success early in professional poker just go onwards and upwards. It, you know, were there difficult moments and what were they? What were the challenging moments that, the key points in your career where it could have gone one way or the other, perhaps, but you managed to keep going and maybe go to the next level. Yeah. I mean, there, so there's a lot of that, um, you know, 20 years is a long ride, uh, in poker. So it's like, it's, it's in, in, in any discipline or profession, it's never straight up into the right, but obviously mm -hmm. in something like poker, it's even less of that because there's more volatility in poker than say being, I don't know, a doctor, like, yeah, you're gonna have setbacks, but it's not like you're gonna have, you know, six months of setbacks, most likely, right? I mean, I'm not diminishing what it takes to be a doctor or, or a lawyer, maybe you fail the bar exam, and you have a six month setback in, in legal. 
Um, but in poker, it's like very real where you can actually like be in a worse place, you know, three months mm -hmm. later, very often, like it doesn't like happen once it happens like every year, not every necessarily every year, but you know, it happens all the time, right? It's a very common thing. So it's less about the setbacks and more about how you respond to the setbacks, right? It's kind of like the famous adage, like, doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down, as long as you don't get knocked out, it's sort of like that, like, as long as you get back up, you know, as long as you keep fighting, uh, doesn't, 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 doesn't inherently mean you will win, but it means that you at least won't lose. <laughs> so like you're drawing dead if you're not going to, you know, get back up. So I had many of those setbacks. I guess the biggest one was, you know, after this, you know, million dollar upswing in when I was 20, 2007, like I, you know, went on a million dollar downswing. So I lost back most of the money I won. I went from playing 200, 400, no limit to 510. Uh, which is a big drop, you know, one preflop raise was a buy-in. So just kind of imagine that if you're playing, you know, whatever, even if you're playing 510 right now, you make it $15. Imagine you going to a game where the buy-in is $15, right? Just to put that into perspective, it would be kind of you know, dramatic. Uh, it's very hard to play well. Uh, it's, it's obviously was a challenge, like, to you know, egoically, like just thinking, you know, I was playing the nosebleeds where everyone's sweating my games online. There's like, media attention you know you're kind of like you know all the hands are being reviewed and whatever and then you go back to playing these like games nobody cares about you're like you know yeah. back back down at the bottom um uh so that was very challenging that was a big setback i easily could have quit then um that was a, definitely a time where there was a lot of uh challenge around that like psychologically just in the sense that there was a lot of you know i told you so you know you, you know you the ups and downs and you know you get you know, you busted you didn't manage your role correctly you know you're not equipped for this you're not cut out for this you're not good enough uh, you're not strong enough like there's all these there's all there's all that surrounding it too so as if the downswing wasn't already hard enough then you have like the group think confirmation of like you know you screwed up um so it was really challenging uh period for me there's other setbacks too like just in macau i had some some moments where you don't always win you know you play big games you take a shot uh the difference between the game at the win and the game at star world was very big so going from one game to another, like you can be winning in terms of units, but if you lose three sets in a row in the game, that's five to 10 times as big, like, you know, that's, I would do the math sometimes and be like, Oh my gosh, I just lost like three months of time at, at the win. And like this, this like <laughs> these couple sessions. Uh, so those, that's really disheartening. Like there's, there's a lot of times in, in anything in life when I think, you know, you think about quitting, even just, you know, in business, I've thought about like, you know, just, I don't want to do this anymore. It's frustrating. It's like tilting. There's a, there's annoying aspects, but I think poker kind of really exacerbates that. And it really challenges um, all of that angle gets challenged more in poker just because of the nature of the game. And so I think that's an interesting thing because every one of those challenges is like, if you look at it, it's not like necessarily a race because you're not necessarily competing with everyone else. But if you look at it, like whatever, 10,000 people a year start out on this venture right? And everyone starts at the starting line and everyone's excited. Everyone's going to win. Everyone's going to crush it. And it's kind of like a marathon, right? So each mile, there's a number of people that don't go from mile one to mile two and mile two to mile three. Everyone gets to mile one. Like you can mm -hmm. walk to mile one, right? Everyone can do that. But at each subsequent mile, there's a number of people that don't make it to that subsequent mile. So you kind of have to look at it like that, where it's like each mile is a test and each test gets incrementally harder, right? And, and you're more fatigued with each subsequent mile. So it's actually seeming like it's getting exponentially harder. And so it's kind of like that on a quest to, you know, reach the top of a mountain or achieve something in your personal or professional life. It's just like, there's always, there's always going to be tests and they're there to, you know, show you how bad you actually want it. And so I think yeah. it's a good thing to look at it like that. Absolutely. I mean, I'd be interested in your thoughts on this because in my experience, yep. especially with the quality of training resources out there, or at least potentially out there now, that the quality of technical knowledge in general in the field in poker is way stronger than when I started. I don't just mean I started as a professional. When I started, I think it sounds like I may have started playing at a similar time to you, which was the onset of the online boom, the moneymaker effect yep. and all of that. And training resources have just improved so much since those days. Um, and I think most players now should have a good technical game. It's, it's a massive mistake if you go into professional poker and you really haven't explored all of those options to improve your technical game. But once you get there, 
it's still the case that a lot of people who start on that start line as professionals do not make it. So what would you say is going on there? Because if I'm right, that most people do have a pretty good understanding of the game tree, something else is happening to make them not see their way to the finish line. What is going on in your view? Well, the, the, the high level view I have is that a lot of people are good at playing poker, but not that many people are good poker players. And so you, you really need both, right? It's, it's kind of like 50-50. Your, your technical knowledge is one thing, but your ability to implement your technical knowledge is as important. And so one question I always ask my clients is, you know, they tell me, oh, you know, I'm good at this. Or when, I, when I play my A game, everyone will say, I, I bet you everyone listening can relate to this, that feeling of, you know, you're in the zone and you can just see everyone's cards as a metaphorically, you can you figure out, you know, whatever, where everyone's at, you feel like you're just locked in and you can't lose that day no matter what, because you're playing at a level that when you play at that level, you're just unbeatable. And everyone's probably nodding their head. They could relate to that. So one question I always ask my clients, and my clients tell me this all the time. And I say, well, John, how often do you play that A game? And then that number maybe is what, 70%, 40% for some people. Some people play that, that once a month, twice a month, they get into that zone. Some people don't get into that zone that often. And then while I tell them, look, you know, the difference between where you're at and where you want to be is if you watch another athlete like Kobe Bryant, Novak Djokovic, you know, how often do they play at that zone? Well, 90, 90, 98%, 99%. How often does Kobe Bryant have a bad day? Like he doesn't really have bad days. He has like not perfect days or not excellent days or not, you know, but he doesn't have like a C game that just doesn't exist. So he has an, he has an A plus game and an A game. And so, and he plays that A plus game, you know, 97% of the time. And that's, what's the difference between, you know, world-class and, a, and, a, and another player that's, that's good or great or very good. And so it's like that in poker too. So a lot of what, you know, I'm not saying you don't have to improve your technical game. You know, Kobe was in the gym, you know, eight hours a day dribbling the ball, but at the same time, you have to have that consistency. And especially in a mental sport like poker, where there's emotional volatility, there's ego involved, there's psychology involved, you know, having that consistency is a lot more of a, of a discipline challenge and mental challenge than it is in another sport. Um, and so, that's a huge component of poker. And so I think working on that and my own experience, having worked on that uh, in isolation and extensively over the last decade really has transformed my game. I think I, I had a lot of raw talent, but I didn't always, I wasn't always mature enough to play at the level of my ability. Whereas now I feel like I could, I could engineer and turn on that state. And so it's not something that just happens where I kind of go to the game and then, oh my gosh, yes, I'm locked in and this is great and it just happened and I don't know why I've kind of learned how to manipulate all of the variables to engineer myself to get into that state so I could control it and it's a conscious decision now and it's it's engineered now and so that's been I don't, I don't always get there I'm not perfect I don't play perfect 100% of the time not by far from it but at the same time there's a very direct correlation between the inputs and the outputs and a high level of consistency at that output and so that's been a you know a game changer for me personally, and that's something I work on with clients. And if you just think about your own poker journey, those who are listening, like what percent of the time, you know, be very rigorous in yourself. I'm not talking about you play very well because you know everyone, not everyone, a lot of pros play very well just by default. But what percent of the time are you absolutely locked in where you have that sensation that you can't lose no matter what because you can see everyone else's cards and you're just completely in the zone and you know, you and the table are in color and everyone else is black and white, right? Like what percentage of the time are you at that level? And that's, that's the only thing that matters. And if that, that number is not above 90 and if most likely a lot of people will say it's probably about 50, um, that's a huge Delta between where you are and where you could be and what your potential is. And so that's something to work on. Absolutely. I mean, your answer is absolutely music to my ears because as a performance coach and somebody, you know, I still do coach professional poker players, not just on performance, but also on technical aspects. Um, you know, people will strive to go from A to A plus on their technical game, but those, those elements are really right. hard to get. Once you already get really good, it's hard to get that extra percentage and they won't think twice totally. to spend more money on a new course. You know, if they're struggling. They'll say, yeah, let's buy a new course. So let's get some more coaching on the technical side, missing the fact that actually a lot of the time, they're not playing anything like their existing A game. And that's where they're dropping all the money. They're going, they're playing a C game or worse. 
And that's not to do with a lack of technical knowledge. It's, it's to do with other aspects of performance. What I'm really going to be interested in is what you do to improve those aspects, those non-technical aspects. Tell, if you could share with everybody what, what it is that you found took you into that zone much more often. Well, it's a little bit what you said, like it's first just an awareness of, um, of, 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 of a defect and, and the will to want to learn that, you know, most of my clients, I always tell them they, they really are focused on, they really want to work on the strategy. Some people have an awareness that they want to work on this or that tilt is a problem, for example, or that lack of peak performance is a problem, I guess is a more broad way of saying it. But, um, most people are focused on the strategy, which is kind of like the artwork on the wall. You know, it's what makes the house beautiful, but it's not the foundation. And so what I think is important is to first and foremost, like build that solid foundation. And so that comes in a lot of forms. You know, one way of working on it is, um, is, is just a, is a better bankroll management system. And I think that has downstream effects of allowing you to take more risks because when you're sure that the amount of money you're playing with is sufficient for the games you're playing, it's easier in real time to not feel that, to not feel held back by taking certain risks because you're apprehensive about the money. So for example, if you were to move down two levels in stakes, let's say you play 510 and I told you, let's go play one, two, you'd be a lot more confident. You probably play a lot better. You probably, you know, maybe you would, you, maybe you wouldn't play well enough because the game is too small. But if you move down like one level or a level and a half where you still care about the money, but it's you're pretty insignificant at this point, that's when you actually probably play your best. Um, so playing one level smaller than what you play is probably the best for most people. And so with that framework in mind, it's easier to make big bluffs on the river. It's easier to be more aggressive. It's easier to make, you know, three bets or four bets preflop or double barrel and do all these things that, you know, you need to do from a technical aspect to win, but that actually are psychological aspect, but it's because the up, the upstream problem is the bankroll management, right? So it all kind of brings, it all kind of comes together. And when you think about, you know, real-time decision-making at the table and why that perhaps is not at the level it needs to be, like there's upstream problems from that. So it's kind of all like all of these things are connected and being aware of like where they all fit into play. But then on the performance side too, it's like, okay, if I want to be like just at a high level, right? There's a lot of things you can do, like look into biohacking or whatever. There's, you know, 20 things you can do to kind of increase performance uh, across the spectrum. I would, you know, I would say test everything and see what works for you. And that's kind of been my approach of like trying every single thing and isolating individual variables and seeing what things really help. And then also having a like, different pregame routines to kind of get me in this the peak state I need to be in based on how long I have. So I know if I have, you know, an hour, I have time to do these three or four things. If I have 15 minutes, well, I only can do one of those things. So which one is the 80-20, right? Which one gives me the most impact for the least time? Uh, and so it's kind of like basically customizing a different uh, routine or a different approach or a different preparation strategy to get you at that peak level. But on a high level, you know, thinking about, the fact that you are a mental performance athlete, right? So with that in mind, like being in the best mental and physical and spiritual shape possible are all going to funnel into you being a better poker player. Uh, so there's a lot that comes into each one of those buckets, but just on the physical side, I, I feel like being having your body up being very function very optimally through your diet and your nutrition, whatever supplementation, sleep, exercise, fitness. I think, I think a good way to measure that is just, you know, if you look at, you know, blood tests, your biomarkers, see how you're doing. If you look at uh, your physical appearance, right. Cause you know, your, your body is one thing that you can't buy. You have to earn. So if you're, if you're actually in great shape, it's probably a good proxy that your, your inputs are doing very well. Cause the output is the physical manifestation of your body and how you look, how you perform, how strong you are, how fast you can run your cardiovascular ability. Like all of those things are going to help you be better at playing poker at the table. Um, so the mental side, like, you know, where, where you're at spiritually, like obviously meditation helps working with, you know, coaches helps hypnotists, whatever, like all of those things, um, uh, having accountability, goal setting, uh, all, all those things, having like a clear intention for what you want to do for each session, how you want to play. And then, you know, the spiritual side, like things you want to work on, right. If you're, uh, very, let's say your you know, ego gets in the way of your decisions, right. You have to kind of work on yourself spiritually, right. You have to be a better version of yourself. You have to level up your character so that your defects as a person don't manifest into losing at the poker table, right? So if you suffer from, um, you know, 
you don't like losing because you're very competitive and you, whatever that stems back to something as a kid where you always had to be competitive to beat your older brother. And you're taking that bullshit to the poker table and you're trying to beat the bully at the table and you just get wrecked because you just call down when he's not bluffing, like that's going to manifest into you being an inferior poker player, right? So you have to kind of work on yourself. You have to kind of like upgrade Absolutely. your software to be a better person so that you can actually make better decisions at the table. So, I mean, if you think about the physical, the mental and the spiritual buckets, I mean, there's, it's, it's a lifelong journey. It's not like, you know, I've been working on this stuff for 10 years. I'm there's, you know, more that I don't know than what I do know. So it's like, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a lifelong journey there. And that's kind of what keeps poker and exciting is I think that it, there's always another level. Absolutely. I mean, I, again, I'd endorse everything you said there. I mean, exactly what that pregame preparation and the surrounding life structure is will vary from person to person. But those key elements you've identified are all present, in my view, in my experience, in the best players. They are looking after their mind and body. And, you know, the frustrating thing is when you come across somebody who says, I know that a pregame routine is good, but I just wanted to get on with it. And what they're effectively doing every time they yep. do that is they are limiting their EV for the entire session for the sake sometimes of a 15 minute warm up, even something as short as that makes a difference, but they're, they're basically maybe knocking down their EV for the next eight hours because they just didn't want to actually commit to something. And one thing I'd say to everybody listening is it doesn't have to be lengthy. It doesn't have to be exhausting. It can be quite minimalist, but for example, you said, you said one thing, setting your intentions. I think, you know, a reminder sometimes as to, hey, I've not been doing this enough recently. Just one macro thought to take into your game is really, really helpful rather than just firing up the tables and going. Um, you know, there's not a great athlete in the world who just gets straight off the coach and runs onto the field and plays. Everybody warms up and the mind is the right. same as the body in that way. You know, we have to we have to prepare ourselves. Our brain needs to get in gear and setting intentions you know, including through hypnotherapy, you know, you've touched on that. Actually using visualization and reinforcing it at a subconscious level is much more likely to make you able to execute your pregame plan than if you just simply rock up and hope to just play your A game. So I, I absolutely love everything you said there. Um, I want to just talk about your training site, Alec, um, Conscious Poker. Um, firstly, I'm just really interested as somebody who's also gone I mean, you still play poker. I play a little bit these days, but most of my time is as a coach. Um, <clears throat> tell me about your journey from player to coach and tell me about Conscious Poker and what motivated it and what you do there. Yeah, I mean, it happened pretty organically. I started making content on YouTube in like 2013. It was early to the YouTube game and started making, you know, hand of review breakdowns of hands I played in Macau and traveling around playing various uh, poker games, you know, when Europe and the US, Poker Night in America, whatever. And so that kind of caught on pretty quick where people liked that format and they saw me as a strategist and, you know, uh, accomplished player and that, 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 that mm. was able to help them improve at poker. And so organically from that came a lot of demand for, you know, product services. Hey, do you have a book? Hey, do you have a course? Hey, can you do coaching? And so I kind of got into it from that organic demand that I built for my audience and the trust I built with my audience over time. Uh, I was doing some stuff in media before that. I had a blog on card player and alectrelli.com. I was writing stuff. So I, I, I had written hand reviews before and uh, was communicating with the public for poker, but that really kind of built a relationship with the audience in a way that you don't do through writing where YouTube is a different medium where people get to know you through video, you know, and respond to comments and stuff like that. We do lives and whatever. So that kind of launched that whole thing. And I, I wrote a book. After that, I started to build some courses. And then so I kind of combined all that and got clarity around, uh, you know, what was unique about <clears throat> my process and my coaching and my clients and the people I had worked with uh, and built Conscious Poker in 2017. And the idea is basically that, you know, kind of what we touched on today is that, you know, being more conscious helps you make better decisions, which helps you win more at poker. So it's like, it's kind of the, it's kind of like a, you know, in, in some ways, it's kind of a spiritual journey in the sense that you, you're you only as good of a player as you are as your the your ability to level up your own character, right? So if you really suck at discipline, for example, you're not a disciplined person, 
well, like you're very limited to what, how far you can go in poker, right? You're not going to be, you're going to be calling too many hands. You're going to be not, you know, playing too many hands. You're going to be chasing too many draws, but you're also not going to be studying enough. You're not going to be going through your pregame routine. You're not going to be, you know, giving poker the reverence it deserves, right? So the only way to fix that problem at the root cause is to become more disciplined person, right? So you have to be more conscious of the problem of the actual root cause of the problem. And you also have to be more, it's kind of level up spiritually, right? You kind of have to build your character. <laughs> it's like an individual, right? It's kind of like a little video game. So that's, that's kind of the idea there. And, and the other, the other side of it is basically that like, you know, a lot of the decisions and principles that you learn in poker um, will help you off the felt as well. And so a lot of the things I do in my talks and keynotes and, um, and things like that are like, well, if you can learn, um, you know, there's, there's two sides of this. I mean, like from a technical side, if you can learn a basic framework for decision-making, like look at this, look at the, look at the situation objectively, right? Let, you know, ego aside and let your own desires be, a, you know, aside from the actual reality of the situation, view a situation objectively, which is a great heuristic to adopt to investing or decision-making or a job or, a, you know, a partner or a friend or whatever. But look at the situation objectively, pretend like you're not actually the one in first person, but you're reviewing the situation of someone else. And then calculate a basic, you know, risk reward probability of like, hey, this is how much I have to risk, this is the upside, and this is the probability that that happens. And here's my expected value. If you could basically flex that muscle through your decision making framework in poker, you know, a 1000 times a month, 2000 times a month, depending on your hands you play. And you build that muscle of thinking through the process of making decisions in that analytical way. It's very helpful when you start to analyze other aspects of your life about what the right decision is, you know, like, should you buy insurance on a product? Well, you know, what's the value of the product? How much does the insurance cost? And what's the probability that the product breaks versus like how many years it would have to last in order for the insurance to cover the product versus like, how much can you afford to take that risk with the cost of the product relative to your net worth or your bankroll? So it's like, if you could basically get to that same framework that you can apply outside of poker, like it's very helpful proxy for decision-making. And on the non-technical side, it's, it's everything else. Like if you can engineer a peak state where you're at your best level of performance, when you go to play poker, well, shit, you know, you can also do that when you go to a meeting or you go to work or you go to any environment where you want to be, um, you want to be at the, you want to be at your best. Right. If you can force yourself to get through a workout because you want to build your mental resilience so that you can take that mental resilience to the table, you know, you're going to be a better person. You're going to be in better shape. You're going to be, you know, better apt to handle adversities in life too. So I think it's a lot of, a lot of things that you do to get at a, a lot of things that you have to do to get Excel at a very high level at poker also will help you outside of poker as well. And that's kind of the conscious journey too. No, I, I absolutely love it. And I love, I love why the conscious element of conscious poker comes in because it's interesting. I just did a talk. It's going to be released as a video shortly with Elliot Rowe. And um, I'm talking about heuristics. And the truth of the matter is we all use heuristics now. But the trouble is, if you don't consciously reflect on them, cognitive biases, emotions tend to invade the heuristics we use. I mean, heuristics are just a simplification. Um, but unfortunately, the human brain tends to gravitate towards biases and emotions to simplify. But by doing what you say, stepping back, and saying, okay, what is my, th what should my thought process be here? It's remarkable if you actually do that in poker technically, uh, also being aware and looking for where your biases and, and emotions creep in, you will be able to stop yourself more frequently from going down the wrong route. And you'll actually start to become more aware of, of where your decision-making process becomes distorted. So I absolutely love the thinking behind <clears throat> conscious poker. It's, it, it's great. And the other thing that you touched on there was getting into a peak state. And again, the, there's a huge amount more knowledge that, about that now than there was 20 years ago. Um, I work with the Flow Genome Project as a, as a mentor, and they work with people like the US Navy SEALs and, and Google. And we now know so much more about flow states than we did when Mihai Csikszentmihalyi first effectively identified that they were something that could be trained. Um, and there's some fantastic resources out there to actually make sure you get into a peak state. But I mean, what I would say to everybody listening to this is do go ahead in the show notes, you will find a link for Alex Conscious Poker website. And um, there's going to be, I mean, I've already subscribed to Alex newsletters, so some great free resources there. Go and have a look. Um, because I absolutely love the philosophy behind what Alex doing. So it's fantastic. Worth, worth checking out. I love the holistic approach. 
Um, so let, let's just get on to the future, Alec. You've come a long way. Um, what's your vision and goals for the future? Where do you go from here? Well, I mean, I kind of see it in different buckets, right? Like I'm involved in different things. So there's me as a player, there's me as a coach, there's me as a business owner. And so like, you know, there's personal life. So, I mean, there's kind of different buckets where I have uh, a different object, different objectives and different things like that would be meaningful. I guess like the last thing as a player that, you know, would be, would be meaningful would be the main event, which was, which was a, a funny sort of thing this year is because like my goal was to, I put, put a video out about this when I turned 30 like one of my five goals for my thirties was to final table to me. So it's very bittersweet getting 11th. <laughs> I had a 10,000 cause I'm like so close. Um, but it's, it's kind of, it's, it's kind of one of those things in, in life where it's like, it's a success, but it's a setback. And so it's like, how bad do you really want it? You know? And I, I know the preparation and the intensity and the struggle I, I went through this year to get, get that far. And it's like, do I want to push myself harder to be a little bit better to give myself another chance next year? Do I want to be in that state where I believe I can do it? Uh, or do I want to just be like, oh, that was once in a lifetime. It's never going to happen again. And I kind of give up on the dream. So that's kind of something that I, I look at as a challenge. And I think, you know, that would be like the last bucket list item that I would really want in poker. Um, and I've, you know, I've had a great career. I've been fortunate and I've, I've, I've done as a player what I, what I set out to do. Uh, it's not that I've done everything, but just for me personally, like I feel, I feel like content as a player. And so that's kind of the last, that was my last bucket list item when I turned 30. And so like, it's, it's kind of a funny uh, journey this year for me, uh, getting so close. So 36 now we'll see. Um, and that would be a cool thing as a player. Uh, and then, you know, expanding things on the business side, like serving more people through conscious poker, doing more keynotes, uh, you know, writing a book someday about my life as a poker player of high stakes poker, especially centered around my journey in Macau, uh, you know, some stuff in Vegas and traveling around too, but uh, mainly centered around the high six games in Macau. That was kind of a unique pocket, a unique window in history where um, I feel like it was part of something special. And, and you know, not that many people can tell that story um, playing in the in the big game out there. So that that would be a really cool one. Um, you know, see that as a book or, or a TV show someday would be would be a dream item. Um, and then, yeah, like, you know, just being able to connect with others and speak and grow the brand. Um to help share the message and, and, and things like that, I think is, is, is really rewarding too. And it's, you know, I gave a talk at USC recently to the poker club there. Um, and so that was really cool to just be able to like connect with the young people, the next generation. And they, you know, it's kind of surreal. They like look up to you now and like see, you know, where they want to go. Um, and so it's really cool to be able to give back and share things and like help them and, you know, be a, be a resource and inspiration for them. And so doing things like that is very rewarding too. Um, so more of that, and yeah, I'm, I'm driven, but content, you know, so, um, find a, find a balance between those two things of things I want to do, but also just more of what I'm doing and staying in the zone, staying in flow, kind of like just, I guess one of the goals, I guess, is just like, listen to what I actually feel like doing in that moment. And just following that level, that level of energy, instead of forcing myself to just try and, you know, achieve something for the sake of doing it, or just kind of go a certain direction without thinking about it or being as conscious about it, but rather just saying, you know, what's, what's right for this moment, this month, this week, this, you know, this, this, this energy right now and, and, uh, going, uh, going along with that. That's great. What a great manifesto for life driven, but content is the title. I absolutely love it, Alex. Thank you so much for sharing all of your thoughts so generously and your time. And as I say to everybody, do look in the show notes for Conscious Poker, sign up to Alex, Alex's newsletter, and thank you again, Alex. Yeah, I'm just at Alex Torelli on social too. So Twitter, Instagram, uh, come say hi. I'm very friendly on there and uh, happy to interact with all of you guys and uh, appreciate everyone's attention. Uh, come say hi. Love to, love to connect. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. Absolutely. And again, we'll put all of those links in the show notes. Alex, thank you so much. You've been listening to the Mindset Advantage podcast. To get future episodes delivered to you automatically, make sure to subscribe via iTunes, Stitcher, or your favorite podcasting service. To get any resources mentioned in the episode or to listen to past shows, visit pokermindcoach.com slash TMA podcast. Thanks for listening.